If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. This is not a separating message, message in, for, in terms of the church. This is a call into the church. No matter how hard the message may be, it is a call into the church. It's not a condemnation of the church. And I'm glad that you could say that just before this lecture. <laughs> hey, because some things have to be said sometimes. And uh, it's not easy. You know, people say to me, why should they be in the church? And is the church going to survive anyway? And by the way, who is the church? There are so many definitions of the church. Who's the church? Isn't it just those who finally just believe the truth? Is it the body that goes through? The church body? Surely not. It's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. Wow, there are so many of these questions out there. And uh, we've got umpteen groups out there that say this is no longer the Seventh-day Adventist Church body is no longer the church. That's not the church. So we had to look at this issue and address it faithfully and see what the Word of God has to say and see what typology has to say and see if we can fit it together. This is probably the hardest of them all to give, this one. So, by the grace of God, Let's see if it can bring about a transformation, a renewing of the mind, and discernment to discern right from wrong. Let's just go back into history. These are the Persian ruins where the story and Esther and Mordecai unfolds. And... Uh, the actual ruins. Esther 1 verse 1, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. He was also known as Xerxes. This is Ahasuerus who reigned from India even unto Ethiopia. <laughs> Just been there. Over 107 and 20 provinces. This was a mighty kingdom. It's enormous. That in those days when the king Sarah sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. There are some of the ruins of Shushan where many of the exiled Jews settled. So this is in the time of the banishment. He's also known as Xerxes. And it's fascinating. This is the one who fulfilled the Bible prophecy regarding the total destruction of Babylon. Cyrus conquered Babylon in the year 539, but he didn't destroy the city. And uh, Isaiah said it would be destroyed, totally destroyed. 
And this was left to this king who destroyed the city 59 years later in 480 BC. So this is a king who serves a typological role. Is there another king who will come and destroy Babylon? There's another king that will come. So even the pagan kings can be used in type. Isaiah 13 verse 19, And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees excellently, shall be as when God threw, overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch the tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. This is the king who destroyed Babylon. And he's a type of another king who will come with glory and great power and destroy Babylon. I took these pictures in uh, the museum in London. The king gave a great feast and then wanted to show off his queen. But the queen Vashti refused to come out of the king's at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him. That's just sort of a little background to the story. So this is where Mordecai and the beautiful Esther enters the story. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Yekaniah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful. E type type who Mordecai when her father and mother were dead took for, her own, for his own daughter here was an orphan child here was an orphan child I will not leave you orphans does it ring a bell? A cuneiform tablet now in the Berlin Museum mentions a high state official by the name of Marduka, the Babylonian transliteration of Mordecai. Isn't that interesting? Who, with the title of whatever that is, served as an influential counselor at the court of Sushan in the time of Xerxes. That's the king. No other person by this name and holding this office in Susa under Xerxes is known either in the Bible or from other sources. This comes from the Bible commentary. And the king loved Esther above all the women. <laughs> and she obtained grace and favor in his sight. Do you hear gospel sounds here? More than all the virgins. Do you hear gospel sounds? So that he set the royal crown upon her head. <laughs> Do you hear gospel sounds? Oh, this is nice. And made a queen instead of Vashti. And in those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Now what does the gate stand for? It was the court. It was judgment. So when you read about a gate in the Bible, judgment, judgment. Two of the king's chamberlains, Big Tan and Teresh, so he was in judgment. He, he, you know, the judge hears many things. Of those which kept the door were wrath and thought to lay, sought to lay hand on the king, Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. So here, he actually saved this king's life, and the king chronicled it, and wrote it down, and then forgot about it. And that would serve for something that would happen later. Now we're not going to do the whole story, we're just going to concentrate on some of the aspects that have to deal with 
the typology of the end time church. Chapter 3, and these kings and these things King Araceus promoted Haman. So then he forgot about that and then there was this man Haman and he promoted him. And it gives his genealogy and advanced him and set his seat above all princes who were with him. So he made this Haman his highest official. And all the king's servants who were with the king within the king's gate, so all those who were responsible for the judicial aspects of the kingdom, in other words, the rulers, the judges, they had to bow and pay homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. Will something happen like that in the end as well? Will we be forced by some king to worship uh, another king? So there's a double part typology here. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. He's such a stubborn man, isn't he? Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's word would stand for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He wanted to get the whole lot. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Now we're getting to a typology. This is what will happen at the end of time. It's the type. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So they were going to destroy all the Jews and they set a date. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered and dispersed amongst the people. Does that sound typological? What a nice story. In all the provinces of your kingdom, their laws are different from all the other people's. Does that sound typological? And they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. Kill them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. Hmm. These the people are deceitful. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Amadata, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. So this is a typological story and we must study it. These are the ruins of the actual royal palace where all of this took place. Mordecai challenged Esther to discuss the matter with the king, but she was scared. And so Mordecai said to her, don't think you're going to escape because you're the pretty wife. You're not going to escape. You'll die too. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. You're going to die. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. Now, remember this. This is a serious, critical issue. And she sets three days aside to pray. Do we do that? My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. 
Is there a type here? I'm also living in transgression to God's law. This is actually the typology of grace. Remember this king is the one who destroyed Babylon? There's another king who is coming to destroy Babylon. He has this double role here. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. Oh, it's a nice verse. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. And then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. So when Ahasuerus reverses the decree, judgment came on Haman's head and a counter decree was issued by the king. And many non-Jews were converted during the crisis and took their stand with the Jews. That's what happened. So there was a death decree, and the king reverses the death decree. Will there be another king in the future when there is a death decree who will reverse the death decree? And his bride, when she comes to him, if I perish, I perish, my only hope is you. Will he hold out the scepter to her, yes or no? And in every province, in every city, wheresoever the king's command and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Probation for the world closes before or after the probation for the church? After. So there's time for a loud cry for the outpouring of the latter rain and a conversion of many of the people. Ah, I like it. I like it. So type is going to meet anti-type, the mark of the beast. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that would that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as was not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, the name of the beast or the number of his name. We know the story. That's the antitype. The decree which is to go forth against the people of God will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. Satan instigated the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserved the knowledge of the true God, but his plots were defeated by a counterpower that reigns amongst the children of men. Type, anti-type. The Protestant world today sees in the lump little company keeping the Sabbath a Mordecai in the gate. So who's Mordecai in the gate? We are. We are Mordecai in the gate. We are the people of judgment. We are announcing the time of his judgment has come. His character and conduct expressing reverence for the law of God are a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling upon his Sabbath. The unwelcome intruder must by some means be put out of the way. This is going to happen. The same masterful mind that plotted against the faithful in ages past is still seeking to rid the earth of those who fear God and obey his law. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. They will not bow down to this decree. They will not bow down to the papacy. They won't bow down. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Not having a thus says the scripture to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. Whenever a church needs the state to enforce its doctrines, it is the absolute guarantee that that church is bankrupt in terms of doctrine. 
On this battlefield comes the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error, and we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Now, as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people. These scenes take place in the final scenes of the great controversy between God and Satan. This is where the judgment of the beast power is reversed by God who intercedes on behalf of his people. Here type meets antitype. Christ, the great antitype of Aceros, reverses the decree. He's the one who holds out the scepter to his bride. He's the one who forgives her sins, embraces her. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And this final fiery trial sifts God's people who are in the Laodicean state because judgment begins with the house of God. Peter says, the time has come for judgment, gate, must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Hmm. Now if you look at the word Laodicea, what does that mean? Judgment. Gate, judgment. Laodicea, judgment. Mordecai sat in the gate, judgment. The other typical story of the end time people, Daniel, a type of God's end time people means judged of God. So here you have all of these types coming together. Esther 2 verse 9. Isn't this cute? And when the virgins were gathered together, the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Suddenly, typologically, that verse just bursts into significance. The Lord will gather his virgins from the entire land. These virgins had to go through a purification process, if you read the book of Esther. They were purified. And the Lord is gathering them in this judgment time. His virgins. Then Daniel requested of the king, Daniel 2.49, and he sat, said Shadrach, Meshach, Abnegyo over the affairs of the province of ba Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. His name means judged, and he is a type of judge. He sits in the gate. Jeremiah 36 verse 10, then read Baruch in the words of the book of Jeremiah, in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, Gemma, um, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. Jeremiah is also a type of the end time message, the three angels' messages. He also has it read in the gate. Ezekiel, and he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in vision of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh towards the north where the throne of God is. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy? Hmm. Not everything's nice in the church there. Judgment, 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 and judgment begins with the house of God. And if it begin with us, what will the end be of them that serve not God? The Apostle John, in vision, heard a loud voice in heaven exclaiming, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea! For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Fearful are the scenes which call forth this exclamation from the heavenly voice. The wrath of Satan increases as his time grows short and his work of deceit and destruction reaches its culmination in the time of trouble. 
God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. And the Lord withdraws his protection and leaves them to the mercy of the leader they have chosen. This is the end time story. Satan will have power over those who have yielded themselves to his control. He will plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold in check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. In the midst of the time of trouble, trouble as has not been since there was a nation, his, God's chosen ones, will stand unmoved. Satan with all his hosts of evil cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Now how does this judgment affect God's people? And these are the questions that we want to answer. Will the church survive? The standard of judgment, as we know, is the law. But in the final issue, it's about worship. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. The only righteous king is Jesus. Is that right? And when he holds out that scepter, that's a righteous judgment that that bride will not be destroyed. If I perish, I perish. But that's my only hope. Run to Jesus. That's your only hope. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were amongst thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Who's this queen standing at his right hand? His bride. His bride, of which Esther was a type. Isn't typology marvelous? Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thy ear. Forget also thy own people and thy father's house. So shall the king greatly desire thy, thy beauty. Of all the virgins, Esther was the most beautiful. And the king loved her. For he is thy lord, and worship thou him. Wow, that all of these things are written in the Psalms as well. This is magnificent. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, the Messiah, shall come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people be. Typology. All right, let's look at this. The gathering of God's people is the theme of the return from exile. That's the type. It embraces so many aspects that it's almost impossible to separate. That's why the prophet saw wheels within wheels and the confusion. But underneath it all was the controlling hand of God. And God raised up prophets to deal with the different aspects of this exile. And although they are all linked in perfect order, they all have their different tasks and add their voice to put together the puzzle. So when we study God's people just before the final events, we have to look at the full picture. The prophets and governors of the return from exile included the so-called minor prophets like Haggai, Amos, Joel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Nehemiah. All of these together, we have to make a picture of what it was like. The prophet Jeremiah declared, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment in, and justice in the earth. In his day Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. 
And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. What's the issue? Worship. Worship. Therefore behold the days come, says the Lord, that they shall no more say the Lord liveth which brought us up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries whither I have driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Type, anti-type. The type, children of Israel brought out of Egypt. Anti-type, children of God gathered out of all the nations. This is the final event. So they will no longer just regard the type. The anti-type will be the fulfillment. So the exodus movement of Israel parallels the final exodus of the people of God. In these movements, type must meet anti-type. Jeremiah 16, verse 16. I'm going to try and fit in a whole sermon just on this. Jeremiah. Behold, I will send many fishers, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and of every hole of the rocks. So I've written here, we can choose. You can either be a fisher or you can be hunted. What would you like? I prefer to be a fisher of men. I want to be a fisher, Lord. I don't want to be hunted. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherit, inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Jeremiah 16, 19. Isn't this great? This is what the world's going to see. And they're going to come in. Many were converted in Mordecai's time. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again. What does it say there? Second time to recover the remnant of his people. So there was a first time. And he recovered the remnant and he brought them back home. And it's going to be the same. Which shall be left, and then he mentions Assyria and Egypt and Patrot and Cush and Elam. So this is the world picture. So the second gathering is universal. And then he will set up a sign, an ensign for the nations. And shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. What's the sign he will set amongst his people? Help me. The Sabbath. It's the only sign there is. The ensign, the flagship, the banner, the sign. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me. So in the final gathering, the anti-typical gathering, the Sabbath will be prominent. Just setting the stage here. So the second gathering is fulfilled only in the context of the gathering message of Revelations chapter 14 to 18. Because this is what gathers the people. The three angels' messages, the final call out of Babylon, the redeemed from the final gathering, they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Obviously, if you're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, that means you must have passed through a similar experience as Israel. A gathering, a calling out, all of these things. Revelation, they sing the, so, the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. The Israelites could not yet sing the song of the Lamb. He hadn't come yet. But the last people sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. They have this double experience. Type meets anti-type. Saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. Ezekiel 20 verse 34 refers to now. 
So in the final conflict, God does not bypass His church. He didn't bypass Israel. But He will purify it in the fire of affliction and spew from its ranks those that have not been made righteous by His righteousness. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. Yes, but who's the church? The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ and through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers and heavenly places the final and full display of the love of God. Ephesians 3.10 quoted. Okay. The Redeemer of world does not sanction experience and exercise in religious matter independent of his organized, acknowledged, Church, that's closer. Now it's just not some airy-fairy, wishy-washy something. This is this church. Oh Lord, how are you going to get this church to go through? Many have an idea that they are responsible to Christ alone for their light and experience, independent of his recognized followers on earth. But in the history of Saul, we've read this statement. That's not true. God uses his church. So you ask yourself the question, how can I be associated with such an imperfect church? Well, the answer is persecution will cleanse it. Prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. Adversity purges them out of the church. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. And those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment and death. The contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. And this is the time when the gold will be separated from the dross. When does it happen? When the mark of the beast is implemented. So we're going to sit with a mess until when? Till then. Live with it. So in spite of its condition, the church is not Babylon. Although there are many Babylonians in its ranks. I'm just trying to sum it up. In the absence of persecution... They have drifted into our ranks, men who appear sound in their Christianity, unquestionable, but who, if persecution should arise, would go from us. We've got all these people in the church. So when the law of God is made void, the church will be sifted by fiery trials. Not before. As the trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen. We need to study these things lest we become confused. And believe me, our people are confused. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built on the rock. They will yield to the temptation. They will go out from us. They will go. They're going to go. And the Lord has not given you a message to call the Seventh-day Adventist Babylon. And to call the people of God to come out of her, all the reasons you may present cannot have weight with me on the subject because the Lord has given me decided light that is opposed to such a message. Period. Stay in this church, yes. This is the church of God. I know the Lord loves His church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up in independent atoms. There is not the least consistency in this. There is not the least evidence that such a thing will be. I tell you, my brethren, the Lord has an organized body through whom he will work. Anyone 
drawing apart from the organized bodies of God commandment keeping people when he begins to weigh the church in his human scales and begins to pronounce judgment against them then you may know that God is not leading him he's on the wrong track we've got thousands of them on our web pages thousands God is not leading them and brethren if you're listening out there on these DVDs come home don't you set yourself up as judge. God is the judge. Straight testimony produces the shaking. We've had these tests. I'm just putting it into context. I ask the meaning of the shaking. It is the straight testimony to the Laodiceans that will do it. There are those among us who make confessions as did Achan too late to save themselves. Now's the time to make right with the Lord. Do we need an organized church? I mean, people tell me all the time, I don't need an organized church. I have so many people who tell to me, I've been from church to church to church, and I'm sick and tired of church. I'm not going to go into another church. I say, yes, you are. I don't need an organized body. They've all got mistakes. Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in amongst this people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the Word of God. We want to hold the lines evenly, that there shall be no breaking down of the system of organization and order that has been built up by wise, careful lab labor. License must not be given to disorderly elements to desire to control the work at this time. Phew, these are tough things, eh? To reconcile all of these things. Some have advanced the thought that we are near the close of time. Every child of God will act independently. We've heard that. Of any religious organization. I've been instructed by the Lord that in this work there is no such thing as every man being in independent. As we near the final crisis, instead of feeling that there is less need for, of order and harmony of action, we should be more systematic than heretofore. Wow! I like this article, or this statement at least in the article, Beheading Christ, Keith Drury, he makes the statement. I have decided to submit to Christ's tastes in bride picking. If he wants the church as his bride, I will accept her too. Jesus Christ, the head of the body, is easy to love. The body of Christ is harder to love. But I have chosen to love her for one single reason. Christ loves her and considers her beautiful. Perhaps he sees possibilities in her I don't see. Perhaps that's how he sees me too. Isn't that nice? I think that's rather cute. That's rather cute. So there's a special authority of God's church. God has invested his church with a special authority and power which no one can be justified in disregarding and despising, for in so doing he despises the voice of God. Hmm. The highest power in he under heaven is upon his church. I'm instructed to say to the Seventh-day Adventists, the world over God has called us a people to be a peculiar treasure to himself. He has appointed that his church on earth shall stand perfectly united in the spirit and counsel of the Lord of hosts until when? Till the end of time. While it is true that God guides individuals, it's also true that He is leading out a people. Not a few separate individuals here and there, one believing this, another that. Angels of God are doing the work committed to their trust. The third angel is leading out and purifying a people, and they should move with Him unitedly. Okay, so we're not going to go independent. Huh. We must draw together. If men will not move in concert in the great and grand work for this time, there will be confusion. 
It is not a good sign when men refuse to unite with their brethren and prefer to act alone. But now listen carefully. On the other hand, the leaders amongst God's people are to guard against the danger of condemning the methods of individual workers who are led by the Lord to do a special work that but few are fitted to do. Mm. Let's look at both sides of the story. Not just one side of the story. Okay. Let brethren in responsibility be slow to criticize the movements that are not in perfect harmony with the methods of labor. Let them never suppose that every plan should reflect their own personality. Let them not fear to trust another's methods. For by withholding their confidence from a fellow brother laborer who with humility and consecrated zeal is doing a special work in God's appointed way, they are retarding the advancements of the Lord's cause. So, this is very balanced. So how can two walk together unless they are agreed? You know to how many people I've spoken to in these meetings alone who are saying those things to me? You're all sitting here, you're asking this question. Let's try and resolve it. How is such unity possible in the light of such obvious conflict within the church? I mean, it's just blatantly obvious that some of us are sitting on two sides of the divide with a great gulf fixed in between. <laughs> wow. Our church members see that there are differences of opinion amongst the leading men and they themselves enter into controversy regarding the subjects under dispute. Christ calls for unity. Now please note. But he does not call to unify on wrong practices. Are you heaving a sigh of relief already? I am. I am. God is not asking us to be brain dead when it comes to unity. Don't unify on wrong practices. The God of heaven draws a sharp contrast between pure, elevating, ennobling truths and false, misleading doctrines. He calls sin and impenitence the, by the right name. He does not gloss over wrongdoing with a coat of in untempered mortar. I urge our brethren to unify upon a true scriptural basis. Whew, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I would be in deep trouble without that support from the spirit of prophecy. So this means, if I have this right now, you must, you must check me in my reasoning here. Uh, there must be a church within this church. Am I right or am I wrong here? God has a church. It is not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishment. Neither is it the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep His commandments. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Where Christ is even amongst the humble few, this is Christ's church. For the presence of the High and Holy One who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. But he still has an organized body through whom he will work. But he will purge that body. So in the light of the inner conflict, I ask myself the question, can this church possibly stand? Or must it be broken up? The church militant might appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains triumphant while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and the true without spot or stain, without guile in their mouth. We must be divested of our self-righteousness and arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. Sifting is coming. Now, when we look at the time when God is gathering his exiles of his church, the typological factions within the church are to be found in three main prophetic delineations. These are found in the book of Daniel, 
in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Remember, Daniel, he was a prophet among the exiles. Ezekiel, prophet amongst the exiles. Jeremiah, prophet in Jerusalem during the exile, right? With the minor prophets providing specific details. So there's Daniel, there's Ezekiel, and there's Jeremiah. This is a very hard lecture for me to put together. Really, I, I, I shuddered to think that I have to give this lecture. Daniel represents that faction that maintains a faithful relationship to God even in the face of adversity. True worship is here contrasted with false worship. The Daniel faction. I've always wondered and said, Lord, the book of Daniel is not real to me because this man doesn't put a foot wrong. It's very discouraging. All the other prophets are full of faults, right? Daniel is just, man, he's spotless. But that's how Christ sees his what? His bride. It has to be that way. The Ezekiel faction represents those that practice syncretism and have a compromised faith. You all know what syncretism means now? Worshipping God in two different ways. And the Jeremiah faction represents the political faction who, like the Pharisees in the time of Jesus, would sacrifice the truth for the sake of the structure. He's sitting in the hierarchy. He's sitting there in Jerusalem, right? He's in the top structure. Wow. So look at these three factions and see what we can do. And let me say that within each of these factions, it is quite possible <laughs> to change sides. Everybody can join the Daniel faction. So it's not condemning. It's just stating what the prophets are saying. And we have to call a spade a spade. So let's consider the aspects of worship and integrity covered in the book of Daniel. And consider also the aspect of youth. Chapter 1. Health reform and its relation to discernment and wisdom. Would you agree that that's part of the book of Daniel? Okay. Daniel 1 verse 20 and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in the realm so he found them ten times better not five times not three times not twice ten times better in the Babylonian court, Daniel was surrounded by allurements to sin, but by the help of Christ, he maintained his integrity. He who cannot resist temptation with every faculty which has been placed within his reach is not registered in the books of heaven as a man. The, nev the Lord never places men in position so trying that it is beyond their power to withstand evil. Divine power is ever ready to protect and strengthen him who has been made a partaker of the divine nature. How old was Daniel? Yeah, he was about 16 years old. He was young, young boy. What does that say to our youth? It really says something. So decide in your hearts to follow God. Health reform is going to play an important part in the final church. Chapter 2 shows the humility and the inclusivity of Daniel. Even when chosen as a prophet of God, the king asked him, Are you able to make known to me the secret? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven. I can tell you, no, 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 there's a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. He gives the honor to God. 
But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any other living. Verse 30. But for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king and that thou mightst know the thoughts of thy heart. Humility. So Daniel is humble and uh, he's inclusive. Daniel was always inclusive. He did not separate himself from his brethren, not even in their guilt. He had no inclination to start a reform movement. That's important. We have sinned, Daniel 9 verse 5, and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Verse 8. O Lord, to us belongs confusion of faith, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. Verse 11. All Israel have transgressed thy law. Is he inclusive? Does he include himself? Sure. Even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So here's the Daniel faction. It's in the church. You'll find it in the church. Chapter 3, the book of Daniel. So besides the eschatological aspect, this chapter contrasts true and false worship. This is important. We need to know this. The role of music to confuse the senses, compromise discernment, the aspects of total trust under trial, unflinching obedience, allegiance to the true God, all of this is recorded in chapter 3. This is a most important typological story for our time. Daniel 3 verse 7, Therefore at the time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people of the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Except Daniel and his friends. Well, Daniel wasn't there, but uh, his friends didn't bow down. So Nebuchadnezzar got angry and he spoke to them. And listen to what Nebuchadnezzar says. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abnego, that do not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of our my hands. Is music going to be a snare in the last days? Yes or no? It's going to be a mega snare. And no matter how much they sing and bash the drums and all kinds of music, don't let yourself be influenced by a load of drivel. Worship God. And so the three of them answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I've just put the new King James there to show what it really says there. We have no need to answer you in this matter. You know why. We don't have to answer you. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand. But if not, be it known unto thee that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Everybody must be like that young West Indian guy that stood outside that drum bashing corner and say, my Jesus is not in there. Young people, stand up. Don't get confused by what Baal worship wants to offer you. So in all ages, there was a Joseph, there was a David, there was a Daniel, there was a Job, there was a Jeremiah, there was a Stephen, there was a Paul, and there was a John. And they all stood in times of trial. 
just because there's apostasy in the church does not give us an excuse to be apostate in the church. So that's the Daniel faction. Consider the circumstances of the Jewish nations when the prophecies of Daniel were given. The Israelites were in captivity. The temple had been destroyed. The religion had centered in the ceremonies of the sacrificial system. They had made the outward form all important while they had lost their spirit of true worship. The issue is worship, not works. I worship God by obedience. I don't get brownie points for my obedience. Their services were corrupted with the traditions and practices of heathenism. Ours too. In the performance of the sacrificial rites, they did not look beyond the shadow of the substance. The outward glory was removed that the spiritual might be revealed. God stripped it. In chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Daniel, we get insights into God's dealings with the powers of earth, His patience, His justice, and how we should relate to the rulers and the authorities. In chapters 7 to 12 are the prophetic chapters which provide the eschatological insights for God's people to the end of time. Whereas the previous chapters tell us how to maintain integrity in the face of these events, these chapters provide the perfect hieroglyph of the powers that constitute the antitype to the first chapters of Daniel. So we have the little horn power, of Daniel chapter 7, what we should believe in the last days and to marginalize them is to do so at the peril of one's life. This is very important stuff here. Book of Daniel gives us the total picture not only of the attitude, the actions in face of great trial, but also the belief system of the true believers in the church. Deuteronomy 29, Deuteronomy 29, 29, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. If these things have been revealed in the book of Daniel, if we discard them today for expediency, we do so at the peril of our life. So there's a perfect hieroglyph of God's people in the end time church. Daniel faction. Same church. Ezekiel faction. And he said to me, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. They are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them. Thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they will forbear. For they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet amongst them. Ezekiel has a totally different message. He's a compatriot. He lives in the same time. He's speaking to the same church. So now we look at this faction. When I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. Do we have to speak, yes or no? Time has come to speak. Chapter 5, Ezekiel is shown that only a remnant of, rem of a remnant will remain. This church is going to be terribly shaken. We need to pray. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife. And a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind. And I will draw out a sword after that. Thou shalt take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. 
Wow. Third gone, third gone, and a few in number. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire. And burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. Jacob's trouble of the remnant. Ezekiel 7.16 But they that escape of them shall escape and shall be in the mountains like doves of the valley, all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. For whose iniquity? Jacob's trouble. We have to look in here. We have to look in here. And why would God have such harsh judgments? Number one, disobedience. Therefore thus says the Lord God, because you multiplied more than the nations that are around about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are around about you. They're disobedient. Blatant disobedience to God in our church is rampant. Idolatry. Ezekiel 6 verse 4. And your altars shall be desolate and your images shall be broken and I will cast down your slain men before your idols. We've got idolatry in the church. Terrible idolatry. Ezekiel 7 verse 26. They rejected the prophets. Mischief shall come upon mischief and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet. But the law shall perish from the priest and the council from the ancients. When the trouble strikes, they will say, where's the prophet? Too late. Too late. Wake up now. Oof, the condition of the leadership. Ezekiel 8 verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month and the fifth day of the month as I sat in my house and the elders of Judah sat before me that the hand of the Lord God fell there on me and I beheld and lo a likeness of the appearance of fire and from the appearance of his loins even downward fire and from his loins even upwards as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber then he said unto me son of man lift up thine eyes now the way towards the north so I lifted my eyes and the way towards the north and behold northward at the gate of the altar the image of jealousy in the entry. So jealousy amongst groups, says Ellen White. There's the quote. Warning has been given me that the publishing house from the Pacific coast should not, in thought, word or deed, depreciate the office at Battle Creek. Neither should the publishing house at Battle Creek look with envy and jealousy upon the instrumentalities of the Lord as established upon the Pacific coast. So if the Lord produces different organizations, the one mustn't think it can lord it over the other. It's what leadership does these days. Plans should be carefully considered in Battle Creek. The image of jealousy was long ago set up and has provoked to jealousy which has grieved the Spirit of God. Seventy elders, they're in sympathy with idolatry. Ezekiel 8 verse 11, And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them, then he mentions them by name, every man his censer in his hand. So these were priests. Because only they had the censer in the hand. These are the leading people in the church. And a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For the, they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. And then brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat women weeping, weeping for Tammuz. We've got church members that are more in sympathy with Rome than they are with Daniel. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about ooh, five and twenty men. 
It's a fascinating text. There were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they worshipped the sun towards the east. I wonder whether it's coincidence that the executive committee of the Seventh-day Adventist Church consists of about five and twenty men. Now I'm not saying that those individuals are these individuals. I'm just saying that the typology fits the leadership picture very precisely. And they worship the sun towards the east. They're in sympathy with Rome. They're ignoring the little horn faction in Daniel chapter 7. So do we have an antitypical equivalent? Do we have limp leadership in sympathy with Rome in our church, yes or no? If you've read any of my answers to some of the critics, which I never ever wanted to get out, you'll know that we have leadership in sympathy with Rome. You'll know that we have magazines that say, Rome has changed. You will know that there are leaders in sympathy with Rome. I was in Europe. I have so many stories. And I received a phone call in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning. I'm supposed to give a lecture the next day. And the man tells me, I see the title of your lecture and you will not speak on the papacy as the Antichrist. You may speak on science and evolution, but you may not speak on that topic. And I said, why not? And he says, because that's antiquated doctrine. I say, so you don't believe that the papacy is the Antichrist? He says, no, that's antiquated doctrine. I said, but the spirit of prophecy says so. So you don't believe the spirit of prophecy that was written for the previous century. I was still young and fiery in those days. <laughs> I would be far more careful today. <laughs> and I said, you know, when I was baptized, I made several vows. We were asked several things. One of them is, do you believe in the spirit of prophecy? And I said, yes, and I was baptized. You've just said no. So you, in my eyes, do not qualify as an authority over me. Goodbye. And I put the phone down. And I went back to bed. One doesn't go back to sleep very easily then. <laughs> and about five minutes later, phone rings again. And it's a president, a president. <laughs> and he phones me. He was a little gentler. And he begged me not to say these things. And uh, he was diplomatic. And he said, if I can find it within my heart not to say these things, then I mustn't say these things. And he will leave it up to me, but uh, please consider this. So he must have got a blast from the other guy. And then uh, that day, night, I didn't sleep. I wrestled. And true to fashion, I went and gave my lecture <laughs> in spite of them. And all hell broke loose. And I thought I'd really blown it. Half the audience booed. These are Adventists, right? Rejected it. Screamed at me as troublemaker and this and that. Most of them walked out. And afterwards, I was sitting there in the back, packing my slides, feeling very sorry for myself. And uh, I would prayed, and God said, go ahead, do that, and I did it. And then a delegation came towards me, and I thought, oh, no. It was about, I, I can't remember exactly how much, but it must have been close to ten. Ministers, pastors, came behind the curtain onto the stage. And I thought, no, this is the end of me. And they embraced me and thanked me and wept. And we prayed together. And they said, thank you that someone still preaches the truth. So, 
just because some leaders don't believe it anymore. Tough. Remnant belief through the ages, Adventists to be purged of the red whore of the Mediterranean syndrome. So says Malachi Martin in Keys of This Blood. Well, they've succeeded to get many of the, of the, of the leading figures not to believe it. I mean, we have church days in Europe, big church days where all the churches of the countries come together. And there our representatives say, when asked, do you not believe anymore that the papacy is the Antichrist? They say, oh, that was a childhood disease of early Adventism. Yeah, it's been testified in courts. It's not a secret that it's an old doctrine that must be relegated to the trash heaps. This method of cal calculating by the neurosis without allowing any consideration for the secrecy. This is Isis unveiled, Blavatsky. This method of calculating by the neurosis without allowing any consideration for the secrecy in which the ancient philosophers who were exclusively of the sacerdotal order held their knowledge gave rise to the greatest errors. It led the Jews as well as some of the Christian Platonists to maintain that the world would be destroyed at the end of 6,000 years. They're mocking these theosophists, these Luciferians. Gale shows how firmly this belief was rooted in the Jews. It has also led modern scientists to discredit entirely the hypothesis of the ancients. It has given rise to the formation of different religious sects which, like the Adventists of our century, are always living in the expectation of the approaching destruction of the world. Well, Satan doesn't like us, so we must be on the right track. <laughs> called to expose the man of sin, he has called them, the Seventh-day Adventists, to expose the wickedness of the man of sin, who has made the Sunday law his distinctive power. Man, have I quoted this text to some of our leaders. Never receive an answer. That's fine. We are to give the people the warning contained in the book of Revelation. The people are to be shown what they might expect from the papal power. Just because some of the leading figures in our church don't believe these things anymore doesn't make it any less the truth. The church that holds the word of God is irreconcilably separated from Rome. Leadership, if you sit in the ecumenical councils, if you think Rome is not the Antichrist, study your Bibles. One professor said to me, you don't have to preach this, it's not part of our 27 fundamental beliefs. Took the 27th and I started reading it again to make sure. There's a long piece about the little horn and the Antichrist, but it's carefully written. It says the reformers believed that it was the Antichrist. Hmm. And so I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and somewhere in the night season, a thought popped into my mind. Ah! There's a fundamental belief that says that we believe in the spirit of prophecy. And the spirit of prophecy says it. Therefore, it's part of the 27 fundamental beliefs. I'll <laughs> preach it as part of the 27 fundamental beliefs. <laughs> you see, they have all kinds of strange solutions to this dilemma. It is the rejection of Bible truth which makes men approach to infidelity. It is a Backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. That's pretty straight stuff, right? So we have a faction within the church that no longer believes that the papacy is the Antichrist, doesn't want to believe that 666 is a reference to the papacy, even though the Jesuits themselves twice in a row Say it in their own magazine. Ezekiel 16.34 On the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms. Huh. 
Whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredom, in that thou givest a reward and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. That's complicated to understand, so I put the new King James down there for you. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry. Because no one solicited you to be a harlot, in that you gave payment, but no payment was given you, therefore you are the opposite. In other words, what the Lord is saying, there are some in the church who are stupid whores. I mean, a normal prostitute at least gets paid for her services, but you're so stupid you're paying. Right? Isn't that what he's saying? Do we do that? Sure, if we sit in the ecumenical councils and if we have membership, we have dues to pay, which are paid from good church money. We're the opposite of a whore. We pay to be a whore. Yes, we have people like that in the church. And we have leadership who sit in ecumenical councils and I've had them speak to me personally. And I've written letters backwards and forwards to them. And I'm asking them, repent. Come back home. Go and study Daniel 7. I was a Roman Catholic and I became a Seventh-day Adventist because of Daniel chapter 7. When I asked that, when that editor of one of our magazines asked me, why did you become a Seventh-day Adventist? I said, because of Daniel chapter 7. He said, why? He said, because it says a little horn. Oh, please doesn't believe any of that stuff well what can I do is that story about uh, <laughs> no forget it I'm naughty now <laughs> who are standing in the council of God at this time is it those who virtually excuse wrong amongst the professed people of God and murmur in their hearts if not openly against those who would reprove sin is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong no indeed these, unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and holding up the hands of the sinners in Zion, will never receive the mark of God in sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of the wicked, represented by the five men bearing slaughter weapons. This is serious. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost represented by a mark by the man in linen are those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in the church. And please remember that this lecture is in the context of my previous lecture which was brotherly love. Don't separate the two. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such. And they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. You can just look at those statements of the modern papacy. Wow, they are so powerful. I don't have to preach that this is going to happen. There it is. Just read their statements. Blatant apostasy. Arrogance. How did the reformers say? If the papacy is not the Antichrist, then he has tremendous bad luck to be just like him. <laughs> Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Those words will be literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing and the people are asleep. They refuse to humble their souls and be converted. Not a great while longer. Will the Lord bear with the people who have such great light and important truths revealed to them, but to refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience? The time is short. God is calling. Will you hear? Will you receive his message? Will you be converted before it is too late? Soon, very soon, every case will be decided for eternity. We don't have time. In the ninth chapter of Ezekiel is portrayed the fate of the men of responsibility who have not glorified God by faithfulness and integrity. Read this chapter. Note especially verses 4 to 6. Quote it. At the appointed time, the Lord God of Israel will do his work most thoroughly. Ellen White says, study these chapters. Let's read these verses. And the Lord said unto him, 
Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Set a mark upon the forehead of the men that sigh and cry for all the abomination that be done in the midst thereof. We must feel the problems in the church. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Slay old, young, maids, little children, women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men who were before the house. Whew, this is scary stuff. Review and herald, but the general slaughter of all those who do not thus see the wide contrast between sin and righteousness and do not feel as those do who stand in the council of God and receive the mark is described in the order of the five men with the slaughter weapons. Go, let not your eyes spare, begin at my sanctuary. Upon us as ministers, God has placed the burden of solemn responsibility. Realizing that we are chosen watchmen, we should have constant concern and forethought in regard to the state of the church. We should give much time to earnest prayer for divine wisdom and guidance in order that we may know how best to promote God's honor and glory. You have no idea how much I sweated for over this lecture. You cannot even imagine. I don't want to turn weapons against God's church. I don't want to hurt God's church. I love God's church. But if God's church doesn't recognize the times we live in, we're going to die. He has commissioned us to honor him, the omnipotent one in every word and act. From him comes our maintenance. We are to depend upon his sufficiency. So rejection of the spirit of prophecy in the church. Do we have it? Yes. It's rampant. I've never seen so much rejection as we have now. It's tantamount to throwing the ship's compass overboard and then drifting like the rest of the Protestant world towards Rome. And then if you will forgive my tongue in cheek, one could end up up the Willow Creek without a paddle. <laughs> And if not, we could be purposefully driven on a saddle back to nowhere. <laughs> Is it happening? Do we have Ellen White or Rick Warren in the church? Our colleges teach Willow Creek theology. We send hundreds of ministers to be trained. Oh, for that Word, that faithful word from the president of the general conference who said we do not need the training from the mega churches with their questionable theology. <sighs> what a sigh of relief. That made me fall right off my chair. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid we are up the Willow Creek without a paddle. I've sat in many a Willow Creek sermon. They've got everything. Contemplative prayer. I've given those lectures. Look at those lectures. The Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation. Willow Creek is in there. Their theology is there. I'm not going to repeat their theology. And what do, you, what do they dish up to God's people in the Seventh-day Adventist church? But emotional drivel. Excuse me. But that's what it is. In our colleges in Europe, if you don't take that course... They discriminate against you like you cannot believe. I had busloads of students come and weep because they have to take Willow Creek theology. Throw it out! Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination. All those Willow Creek sermons, they take one little text and they begin with Grandpa and they end with who knows where. And if every eye is not weeping and the tissues running, then the sermon was not successful and you come out there emotionally drained and you have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever except emotion. We don't need that kind of sermonology in the church. The times are serious. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination. 
by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling, converts thus gain to have little desire to listen to Bible truth. Their interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attraction for them. A message which appeals to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warning, warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. That's what Willow Creek does. We had whole churches leave the Seventh-day Adventist church because they go into boom-bam-bash theology. It's unbelievable. If truth is sacrificed, we end up with a new spirituality. We start embracing spiritual formation, contemplative prayer, we have leading figures in the churches writing books on contemplative prayer. We have our universities bringing in these things. Look at my video. Look at Victor Gill's on spiritual formation. The opposition is great, but the evidence is <laughs> indisputable. It's Jesuit teaching. Neurolinguistic programming, and I call it salvation by decibel. Have you heard that before? New theologies flourish when truth is abandoned, placing science above scripture. Wow. We had that at the faith and science meetings. The European representative got up and he said exactly that. And my division president from my country came to me and he said, Walter, will you please read our decision? And I said, it's not my place, sir, it's yours. He said, I want you to read it to them. And I said, well, if you want me to read it, I'll read it to him. And I went to the front and I said, this is the decision of my division. We confirm a six-day creation, a literal six-day creation. We believe in the spirit of prophecy. We believe that the Bible stands above oh it was such a pleasure it was the opposite of the previous one we're accepting ford theology with its abandonment of the sanctuary message rejection of the investigative judgment remnant theology is gone and ending finally in views which even embrace pantheism we've got all of those things all of them i can tell you stories unbelievable stories I was one in one of our large universities in the southern Pacific. <laughs> and there I gave lectures on evolution creation. And I was shocked. Only one of the young lecturers, and him a new convert, still believed. The others didn't even believe it anymore. They were basically theistic evolutionists if they weren't thorough evolutionists. And so I was not very welcome, but uh, somehow I was invited to do the opening address at the opening of the university. And when they found out that it was me, uh, they managed to cancel that one. So they canceled it. And sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, right? Right? And they got the highest official in the church to do the opening address. But that night, his mother died, which is sad. And at 11 o'clock at night, some other one in command who didn't know about the commotion but knew that I was supposed to have done it, but was cancelled, thought, well, if this one can't do it anymore, maybe that one is still prepared to do it. <laughs> So they called at 11 o'clock at night and said, would you still be prepared to do it? And I said, sure. So we drove there the next day, and as we got there, I saw suddenly a huddle developing in the one corner. <laughs> and there was some furious thinking as to how to, to prevent this catastrophe from taking place. <laughs> and uh, eventually one of them sidled up to me and said, um, I hope you don't mind but our program is incredibly full. We have to reduce your time to 10 minutes. From about 45, right? 
down to 10. That's all we have time to for. It's terribly sorry. So obviously they found a compromise and thought, you know, at least then you can't say anything. <laughs> 10 minutes, Lord, what am I going to say in 10 minutes? The program's incredibly full. So they brought on the band and they brought on the drums and they tried to wake up Baal. But Baal must have been asleep. And so they had to bash that drum for about 30, 40 minutes to see if they could wake him up. Perhaps he was relieving himself. I don't know. Whatever, you know. That's what Elijah said. And when after all that time Baal didn't answer, it was my turn and I had 10 minutes. Why do I tell them in 10 minutes? I got up there onto the stage and I prayed to God, help me, help me, help me. And I preached. And in 10 minutes I told them how I'd come from atheism into this wonderful light and how I'd accepted creationism and how God had worked with me and you know, put me into the university position where I was. And, and then I made an appeal to the young people and I said to them, young people, please, Stand for what is truth. You are here. You are Seventh-day Adventist. If anyone teaches you that God is not the creator and that he didn't do it in six days, then stand up and say, so far and no further. <laughs> Whew. The students actually got up and gave us an ovation. Ten minutes. And then I left and I saw the little mushroom crowd appear. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out and my wife and I were going to the car and here this old pastor I love old pastors in the Seventh-day Adventist church have you met them? he came running and he grabbed my wife and me and he put his arms around us and he wept and he said thank you finally again and then I said to him, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm a retired pastor. And I said, what do you do? I says, I hang around the campus. I said, why are you hanging around the campus? He said, to help a few erring souls here and there where I find them. God has his people. It doesn't matter how big the university is. doesn't matter. I know I'm probably going to be crucified after this series. But I just want to tell you that God has his people in this church. And they will come a shaking. No matter whether they teach formal courses on spiritual formation, eventually the truth will get through. No matter what they do, Ezekiel 14 verse 3, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling blocks of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of all by them? In one of these meetings, a minister from Harlem, got up. This is now a big meeting with all the big knots, right from the top down. And he started crying and he wept. And he pointed a finger and he accused the lecturers at our top universities. And he said, I sent my daughter to our university. And she was a believing child. And she came back an atheist. You made her an atheist. You indoctrinated her. The chairman immediately stopped that discussion of accusation. It's hot. The war is hot. Don't make a mistake. This is a war within the church. Meeting the crisis. What should our response be to idolatry in the church? Iceberg. Meet it. The Kellogg crisis. Shortly before I sent out the testimonies regarding the efforts of the enemy to undermine the foundations of our faith through the dissemination of the seductive theories, I had read an incident about a ship in a fog meeting in an iceberg. For several nights I slept but little, but I seemed to be bowed down as a cot beneath sheaths. One night a scene was clearly presented before me, a vessel was upon the waters in a heavy fog. Suddenly the lookout cried, Iceberg just ahead! There towering high above the ship was a gigantic iceberg. An authoritative voice cried out, Meet it! 
There was not a moment's hesitation. It was time for instant action. The, pilot, the engineer put in full steam and the man at the wheel steered the ship straight into the iceberg. With a crash, she struck the ice. There was a fearful shock and the iceberg broke into many pieces, falling with a noise like thunder to the deck. The passengers were violently shaken by the force of the collisions, but no lives were lost. The vessel was injured, but not beyond repair. That's how you meet the apostasy in the church. There's no other way. Boom. That night I was up at one o'clock writing as fast as my hand could pass over the paper. For the next few days I worked early and late preparing for our people the instruction given me regarding the errors that were coming in amongst us. I've been hoping there would be a thorough reformation and that the principles for which we fought in the early days and which we were brought out in the power of the Holy Spirit would be maintained. She rebounded from the contact, trembling from stem to stern like a living creature. Then she moved forward on her way. Well, I knew the meaning of this representation. I had my orders. I heard the words like the voice from a captain. Meet it. I knew what my duty was and that there was not a moment to lose. The time for decided action had come. I must without delay obey the command. Meet it. We have to start meeting apostasy in the church. Meet it. Meet it. But do it with brotherly love. The sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. We must be divested of our self-righteousness and arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. We must be sanctified through obedience to the truth. And they abandoned their position and they joined the ranks of the opposition. Ezekiel 14, 22, Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you and you shall see their way and their doings and you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. The Ezekiel faction. And then there's a Jeremiah faction. Huh. The leaders in Jerusalem were ruling subject to the approval of the kings of Babylon. Is that right? They were lackeys who had appointed them. Jeremiah was ostracized by the leaders in Jerusalem. He was beaten, placed in stocks, lowered into cisterns and banned from speaking. I wonder what that feels like. <laughs> Jeremiah proclaimed, Has a nation changed their gods which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Please remember there are all of these factions in the church, right? Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So there's a new gospel flowing around. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Let's get back to the ancient Adventist truth. Where is the good way? Walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. It's going to be. That's the antitype. We'll have to do that. Don't be surprised. Also, I said, watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. There are watchmen in this church. They are preaching. You can choose what you want to listen to. Well, let's not let it come to this. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. I wouldn't like that to happen to anyone. Do we have a spirit of popery in the church? That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek, looking out from the side glass at the door and saw a company marching up to the house, two and two. 
They looked stern and determined. I knew them well and turned to open the parlor door to receive them. I knew them well. But thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company were now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession. One bore his hand across another a reed, and as they approached, the reed is, of course, a measure of judgment. So these people were coming to judge God's people. And as they approached, the one carrying the reed made a circle around the house, saying, this house is prescribed, the goods must be confiscated, they have spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me and I ran through the house out of the north door and found myself in the midst of a company, some of whom I knew, but I dared not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I tried to seek a retired spot where I might weep and pray without meeting eager, inquisitive eyes. Wherever I turned, I repeated frequently, if I could only understand this, if they will tell me what I have said or what I have done. I wept and prayed much as I saw our goods confiscated. I tried to read sympathy or pity for me in the looks of those around me and marked the countenances of several whom I thought would speak to me and comfort me. If they did not fear that they would be observed by others, I made no attempt to escape from the crowd. But seeing that I was watched, I concealed my intentions. I commenced weeping aloud, saying, If they would only tell me what I have done or what I have said. My husband, who was sleeping in bed in the same room, heard me weeping aloud and awoke me. My pillow was wet with tears. And a sad depression of spirit was upon me. Well, let's read some more testimonies. A strange thing has come into our churches. Men who are placed in positions of responsibility that they may be wise helpers to their fellow workers have come to suppose that they were set as kings and rulers in the churches. To say to one brother, do this, do another, do that, and do another, and to another, be sure to labor in such and such a way. I receive these phone calls all the time. There have been places where the workers have been told that if they did not follow the instructions of these men of responsibility, their pay from conference would be withheld. One of the pastors in, forget it, his church invited me. His church invited me. The highest authority in that country wrote to him, this man is not welcome, he may not come. It's me. The church wrote back, why? They wrote back, none of your business. They wrote back, double standards. The man is an ordained minister in one region of the world, and here he's not a Seventh-day Adventist worth his salt. We want to know why. Why the double standard? Next letter, if you continue to ask, you will be fired. What a brave pastor. He wrote back, your address is to the wrong party, sir. The church board asked, not me. Please fire them, not me. <laughs> Next letter, you're fired. I've experienced it. I've seen it in the world. Woe be unto pastors that destroy and scatter sheep of my pastor, says the Lord. Jeremiah 23.1 In his labors, each worker is to look to God. We are to labor as men and women who have a living connection with God. We are to learn how to meet people where they are. Let not such conditions exist as we found in some places when we returned to America, in which individual church members, instead of realizing their responsibility, Look to men for guidance and men to whom had been committed sacred and holy trusts in carrying forward the work of God failed to understand the value of personal responsibility and took upon themselves a work of ordering and dictating what their brethren should do or should not do. These are things that God will not allow in his work. Pretty strong words. Fortunately, it's not me speaking. Review and Herald, Spirit of Prophecy. He will put his burdens upon his burden bearers. Every individual soul has a responsibility for God and is not to be arbitrarily instructed by men as to what he shall do, what he shall say, and where he shall go. Did I have the right to say to that second in command, I will not listen to you? I think so. 
We are not to put confidence in the counsel of men and assent to all that they say unless we have evidence that they are under the influence of the Spirit of God. Yes, we can listen to the advice of, of people that are actuated by the Spirit of God. And sometimes, even if you're convicted to say something, there might be good reasons why God says, not now or not at all. So, I really wrestled before I gave this lecture. All should be careful about presenting new views of Scripture. So let me give a balance. I don't only want to knock one side. Before they have given these points, thorough study and are fully prepared to sustain them from the Bible, introduce nothing that will cause dissension without clear evidence that in it God is giving a special message for this time. I have to be very careful. Beware of rejecting that which is truth. The greater danger which our people have been that of depending upon men and making flesh their own. Those who have not been in the habit of searching the Bible for themselves or weighing evidence have confidence in the leading men and accept the decisions they make and thus, may, will reject, and thus many will reject the very messages God sends to his people if these leading brethren do not accept them. Weigh the evidence for yourself. Check it out yourself. Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him under the roll of a book. Poor Jeremiah is sitting in jail. And Baruch comes and says, have you got a DVD? <laughs> and Jeremiah says, yes, I just recorded one. Here's the DVD, go and play it in the courts. So Baruch goes to play Jeremiah's DVD. Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I'm shut up. <laughs> I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go you and please replay my DVD, which I have just recorded, and the words of the Lord in the ears of the people, the Lord upon the fasting days, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. And then read Baruch in the book, the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Jeremiah, the son of Shaphan the scribe in the higher court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house in the ears of all the people. You can lock up the prophet, but the DVD you can't lock it off. <laughs> it's being played. Then said the princess unto Baruch, Go hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where you are. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of the scribe, and they told all the words in the ear of the king, and whew, there was a fire going, and the king cut it out, and he threw it into the fire. Yeah, it's not a popular message. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll, and the words with Baruch wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Actually, I had a Copy saved on my hard drive. <laughs> Here's another copy. <laughs> Go and play that. <laughs> and so there was another DVD. And thou shalt say to Joachim, king of Judah, thus says the Lord, thou hast, thou hast burnt this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land? and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. Therefore thus says the Lord of Joachim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day of the heat, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants, etc., etc. This is hard, eh? Hey? It's hard. This is a type. This is the type of what will happen in our church. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the Babylonian army, which shall take it. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death. Who's asking this? Our own church leaders. Get rid of this guy. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in the city and the hands of the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt 
Wow! This is exactly what's happening in our time. Anybody who dares raise a voice is criticized for breaking down <laughs> the structure and maybe even bringing her to the church. Is it so? Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand. For the king is not he that can do anything against you. Then took they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon. That was in the court of the prison and they let down Jeremiah with cords and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. I took this picture a couple of days ago. And the Lord is amazing. He sent me to this country, Ethiopia. He really rebuked me there, the Lord. I like the Lord. Because I thought, Lord, what am I going to tell these people? As I already told you. But he said, go and speak. And somehow the Lord must have closed our eyes that we didn't realize the full implications. I don't do the bookings. My wife was dealing with people and I was invited there, and I got there, and I went to all the backwaters, and there were thousands of them. I spoke to 7,000 people. And then I discovered that I was speaking to people that had been pushed aside, thrown out, dragged through the courts by my own church. These were disenfranchised Seventh-day Adventists. They had one thing going for them. They believed in the spirit of prophecy with all their hearts. Wow. They kept the health reform in a country where there's nothing. They tell me that it was testified in court that they're not Seventh-day Adventists because they don't drink coffee. Their converts to the church may not be baptized. They asked me, would I baptize their members? I said, no. I won't baptize them. I'm a minister of the Seventh-day Adventist church. If I baptize, I will baptize into the church. Hard decisions. We had long discussions. 7,000 people. And I said to myself, Lord, are these people, 7,000, that have not bowed the knee to Baal? And are they ostracized by my own church? Yes, there are many people in my church that are ostracized. Many that have been removed from the books by people who think that the Pope is, after all, the successor of Peter. Yes, we have them. And I don't know myself how to deal with this. And I'm a little bit of a dilemma because there were 7,000 of them and if there were only 7,000 that didn't bow the, need, bow the need to bail, then what about us and the rest of the world? They're all sitting in Ethiopia. 7,000 of them. And some of them were so poor. I've got hundreds of pictures. I wish I had time to show you. Wow. Lord, what are we going to do? They asked me, would I ordain their elders? I said, no, I won't ordain your elders. I'll pray for them, though. And so they all came, and I prayed for the elders. Is that wrong? I said, Lord, if you want to use these people to spread your message and your three angels' messages, then empower them with your spirit. We have a terrible spirit in some places in the world. But if that spirit, what impressed me, if that spirit can go into the darkest recesses of one of the poorest countries in the world, how much more so can that spirit affect a first world with all its technology? We're going to feel it. 
And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. Do we have that spirit in the church? And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Don't go and look at every ministry and say, You're not of us, get lost. Master said, John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Do not stop him. Whoever is not against us is with you. The spirit of persecution will not be excited against those who have no connection with God and so have no moral strength. It will be aroused against the faithful ones who make no concession to the world and will not be swayed by its opinions, its favor or its opposition. A religion that bears a living testimony in favor of holiness and that rebukes pride, selfishness, avarice, fashionable sins will be hated by the world and will be hated by superficial Christians. That's the bottom line. When you suffer reproach and persecution, you are in excellent company. For Jesus endured it all and much more. If you are faithful sentinels for God, these things are a compliment to you. It is the heroic soul who will be true if they stand alone who will win the imperishable crown. How do I reconcile these things? Here's the answer. A revival will come. If the workers will humble their hearts before God, the blessings will come. They will all the while be receiving. They will all the while be receiving fresh new ideas and there will be a wonderful revival of gospel medical missionary. As the storm approaches a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but not been sanctified through obedience, abandon their position, join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to see the matters in the same light as they. They're all over our church. Now, I'm on dangerous ground, but I'm going to put my foot on dangerous ground. I'm not time-setting. Generations of iniquity. Exodus 34, verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. You know, I never really looked at that verse in this context. Joel 1 to 3. Tell the children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Four generations. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten. That which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. That which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. In every generation, Satan comes and he takes truth. And he takes truth. And by the fourth generation, that which was sowed in the first generation is gone. And then what happens? Four generations. And I will restore to you the years that the locust have eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. Four generations. My great army which I sent amongst you. God allowed the apostasy in the church to cleanse it to find his jewels. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed and shall come to pass afterwards, after that fourth generation that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Four generations. Forty years for a generation. 
four times 40, 160. 1844, 160, 2004. Four generations are gone. We're in the gathering time. I'm on dangerous ground, but I'm going there. Watch. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. Each generation, each day had four watches. The first one began from six o'clock to midnight. That was the first watch. Midnight to six o'clock in the morning, second watch. Six o'clock in the morning to midday, third watch. And then to six o'clock at night, fourth watch. And then you started with the first watch again. Each generation had four watches of ten years each. I saw that watch after watch was in the past. Because of this, there should, should there be lack of vigilance? Oh no, there is the greater necessity of unceasing watchfulness. For now the moments are fewer than before the passing of the first watch. If we watched with unabated vigilance, then how much more need of double watchfulness in the second watch? The passing of the second watch has brought us to the third, and now is, it is inexcusable to abate our watchfulness. The third watch calls for threefold earnestness to become impatient. Now would be to lose all our earnest, persevering watching heretofore. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy because of the master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to leave his people perish has been the reason for so long a delay. So they looked at the watches as they went in the past. Okay. Four gone. Now, let me speculate. I don't know whether he's coming in the first watch, the second watch, or the third watch. Or the fourth. But according to Joel, he's going to come after those four generations and then he will gather because Joel is a prophecy which is applied to the outpouring of the latter rain. Is it not so? Okay. It is at midnight that God delivered his people. Wow. That could put it even at the end of the first watch. That's 10 years from 2004. But God in his mercy has left us a verse. He could also come in the... Second watch or the third watch, you don't know what watch is coming. So I'm not time setting. All I'm saying is the time is very short. And then if I look at, I hear the rumbling. And I see the events. I think we can go home soon. I hope so. But I have to take in account the long suffering of the Lord. Now I want to go even a step, step further. And I know I'm again on dangerous ground. And typology can be such that you can read too much into it. More than there is. And up until now, I've always used spirit of prophecy to back my cause. But now I'm on shaky ground. And I could be totally wrong. But I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Let's look at the shipwreck of Paul. We had two ships now. One, Ellen White's vision of meeting an apostasy. The ship stayed intact. We have to meet the apostasy. Here's a totally different story. And I believe it could just possibly have, I'm very careful in my words, a typological application to God's church. Acts 27 verse 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. Paul was on his way in the ship and he was going towards Rome. 
And this tempestuous wind broke out against the ship. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Acts 27 verse 18. When the storm comes, the ship will be lightened. Now in your mind's eye, consider the possibility that this is the church. The ship. So the ship will be lightened. Okay. Many will go. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. That which holds the ship back or could restrain it. The disciples, Paul, Luke, threw overboard. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, oh, it's a dark time. And no small tempest lay upon us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, lack of food, <laughs> nurture, spiritually speaking now, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosened from, loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life amongst you, but of the ship. Hmm. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. And when the fourteenth night was come, oh, I could read a lot of typology in it, but I'm not going to, just to be careful. As we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight. Does that ring a bell? The shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship. So some said, this ship's not going to make it. We're going to leave right now. <laughs> when they had led down the boat into the sea, so they had a lifeboat ready. They were going to abandon ship. Get out. This is trouble. Under color, as though they would have cast anchor out of the foreship, so they pretended to do something else, but they really wanted to get off the ship. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, and I've highlighted it with a purpose, except those abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Now the ship's already been lighted in the tempest. The dross and the stuff is all off already. The shaking has taken place. There's still a ship. And some think this is not going to work. <laughs> They're going to crush us. Off they go. No, no, no. Paul says unless you stay on the ship you cannot be saved. Wherefore, I pray you, take some food, old English, meat. For this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Oof, there's symbolism in that too. Think typologically. Then were they... All of good cheer. Isn't that nice? And they also took some food, meat. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship. They threw off anything that was unnecessary. And they cast out the wheat into the sea. Seas is nations. Wheat is the bread of life. These are the people that will Bring the loud cry. And when they had taken up the anchor, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosened the rudder bands. They were now totally at the mercy of God. And hoised up the mainsail to the wind and made towards shore. And falling into place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground 
and the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable. So it reached some immovable object. And the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So the ship breaks up. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, there's a captain, a leader, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose. They will try to kill us, says the spirit of prophecy, but they will fail. It will not happen. There's someone in command, and commanded that they should swim, that they which could swim should cast themselves first in the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to the land. And when they had escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, Malta, the island of Malta. That's fascinating. The island of Malta is today, or was always in the history of the church, the military bastion of the Roman Catholic Church, the island of Malta, the Knights of Malta. And the ship might shudder against that rock of the Maltese army of the Pope, of which Obama is a soldier because he's subject, as I showed you the pictures, to the Knights of Malta. So yes, the ship will strike this immovable rock. It'll break apart, but the shaking has already taken place. And some hanging on to pieces go on shore. This is right at the end. Right at the end. Now listen what happens. And the barbarous people, that's the nations around. The shaking has already taken place in the ship. It was lighted in the beginning. Then the wheat was cast out. They showed us no little kindness. They kindled a fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain. Are you thinking typology here? Because of the cold. It's a terrible time. And when Paul had gandled, uh, gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And he shook off the beast into the fire and he felt no harm. Luke tells us, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. <laughs> Satan's attack were cast into the fire. And in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of bloody flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when it was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laid at us with things as were necessary. In the final events, will God's people receive that outpouring, heal people? Does the spirit of prophecy say so? Yes. The spirit will be poured out, even leading men Amongst the nations around will accept the truth. Thousands will be converted under the latter reign. It will be a powerful thing. So this ship will survive right up until the end. And then when it breaks up, cling to the pieces. I don't know whether I'm pushing the typology too far. In visions of night representations passed before me a great reformatory movement amongst God's people. Many were praising God. The sick were healed. Other miracles were wrought. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families, opening before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest. I think the wheat is going to be cast upon the waters. 
And every side doors which were thrown open to the proclamation, on every side doors were thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. The world seemed to be lightened with the heavenly influence. Great blessings were received by the true and humble people of God. May the Lord bless us as we face the final storms. May we think of our church. May we pray for its factions. And may we soon go home. Amen. Amen.